Thank you for joining us on our webinar. Um, we've been asked several questions about doing a webinar on the accountability system, and so we're happy to announce the summer learning series. For today, we're going to get started on understanding the student achievement domain. If you have questions during this presentation, please go ahead and submit all of your questions through Slido. So in order to submit questions through Slido, um, just open any browser. If you have a smartphone or tablet, go to slido.com and enter in the event code TEA domain one. And we'll go ahead and answer your questions as they come up during the presentation. Okay, let's go ahead and get started on understanding our current accountability system. And to understand our accountability system, Let's take a quick look at the history of accountability in Texas. Um, beginning right around the 80s or so, we had our state assessment. And for the first time, the first year in Texas that we assigned campus and district performance with the rating label was 1994. We assigned ratings of exemplary, recognized, acceptable for districts uh, and campuses, and academically unacceptable or low performing for campuses from 94 to 2002. Then we redesigned our assessment. We went from TOS to TAX. And then in 2004, we had rating labels based primarily on the TAX test. And we assigned campus and district performance with the following labels, exemplary, recognized, academically acceptable, and academically unacceptable. And we had additional ratings for alternative education campuses or special circumstances, for example, like hurricane uh, issues. Then we redesigned our assessment again. We rolled out the STAR test. And from 2013 through 17, we had ratings based on one of the following. Either you met standard or you met the alternative standard if you're an alternative education accountability campus. If you did not meet standards, then you were improvement required. And we had a rating of not rated for special circumstances. Then with that um, passage of House Bill 2804 in the 84th legislature, that assigned uh, an accountability system based on five domains, which then morphed into our current three domain system based on House Bill 22. House Bill 22 mandates that the commissioner evaluate school district and campus performance and assign each district and campus an overall performance of, and these are our new rating labels, A, B, C, D, or F, with A equaling exemplary performance, B being recognized performance, C being acceptable performance, D being a rating for in need of improvement, and F equaling unacceptable performance. And F is sort of your new improvement required label. So House Bill 22 was passed, and in 2018, we assigned districts a rating label of A, B, C, D, or F, but campuses still received a met standard or met alternative standard uh, rating. If they did not meet standards, they were IR for campuses in 2018. We released those ratings in 18, but for 19, what we're going to do is we're going to have a, B, C, D, or, or uh, F labels for districts and campuses. So 2019 is going to be the first year that not just districts, but all campuses in the state of Texas will receive a rating label of A through F. Let's talk a little bit about our current accountability system. We have three domains, student achievement, school progress, and closing the gaps. For student achievement, what we're, going, what we're going to do is evaluate performance across all subjects for all students on both star test and alternate assessments. And then if the high school district or K through 12 graduate seniors, we're gonna to look to see which of those graduates are college, career, and military ready. We're also going to look at graduation rates. For school progress, what we're going to do is we're gonna to look to see if the students grew at least one year academically or are on track as measured by STAR results through the STAR progress measure. We're also going to evaluate performance of all students relative to districts or campuses with similar socioeconomic statuses. 
And then for closing the gaps, this is our domain that we're going to use to align with federal ESSA requirements, where we're going to disaggregate performance among race ethnicities, socio socioeconomic backgrounds, and other factors. So closing the gaps is our alignment with federal ESSA requirements. Let's talk about how to get an overall rating label. We have three domains in our current accountability system. This design reflects a commitment to recognize high student achievement, to recognize the impact of highly effective educators, and while maintaining a focus on students most in need. In order to calculate an overall accountability rating, this is what we're going to do. We are going to assign every single campus and district an overall rating label and a rating in each of the three domains. So we will evaluate campus and district performance on student achievement, school progress, and closing the gaps. And we will assign a letter grade in each of those three domains. Then to get an overall rating label, what we're going to do is take the better of achievement or school progress and weight that at 70% of your overall letter grade for the campus or district, with the remaining 30% coming from the closing the gaps domain. So every single domain will have a letter grade. We'll take the better of student achievement or school progress and weight that at 70%, 30% will come from closing the gaps. And based on your overall scaled score, you'll either have an A, B, C, D, or F. Now our grading bands are grading bands that the public understands. A 90 to 100 equals an A, an 80 to an 89 equals a B, a 70 to a 79 equals a C, and so on. So these scaled scores are scores that the public understands for corresponding rating labels for A, B, C, D, or F. For today's presentation, I'm going to cover the student achievement domain. In July, we're, we'll go over the school progress domain, and then on August 7th, we can talk about the closing the gaps domain. So for, days, for today's presentation, we're just gonna solely focus on the student achievement domain. So the student achievement domain. How do we calculate a score for student achievement? Well, if you're in elementary school or a middle school, 100% of your student achievement domain score comes from star test results. Now, if you're a high school, a K through 12 or a district that graduates seniors, then we're going to weight the following. 40% of your letter grade will come from star test results. And then 20% will come off of graduation rates. And then of those graduating seniors, 40% of your letter grade is gonna be based on whether or not you're graduating seniors or college, career, or military ready. Let's first talk about STAR. So for the student achievement domain, we look at STAR test results. This includes STAR tests for grades three through eight and the five end of course assessments. We look at STAR, with and without accommodations, and STAR Alternate 2. If your campus is an elementary, for example, then we look at all STAR tests for grades 3, 4, and 5. If it's a middle school, uh, we'll look at 6, 7, and 8, and high school, 9 through 12. This is for STAR, with and without accommodations, and STAR Alternate 2. All subjects are combined, so we combine everything into a giant STAR test denominator. English learners in their first year in U.S. schools are excluded from accountability calculations altogether. So if you have an English learner and it's their first year in U.S. schools, they are excluded from accountability calculations. Now, if they're in their second year in U.S. schools, they are included in STAR performance indicators using the EL performance measure. It's a different performance standard for ELs in their second years in U.S. schools. Now, if you have a senior who's taking a qualifying substitute assessment, for example, like SAT tests 
to a substitute for their Algebra 1 end of course assessment, then what we do is we include those qualifying substitute assessment results in our STAR calculations at the meets grade level standard. The STAR test evaluates three levels of performance. What we look at is the approaches grade level, the meets grade level, and the master's grade level. So let's just review these STAR performance labels before we get into the calculations. So if a student takes the STAR test, that you receive their performance, like you're receiving their performance this week, they're gonna have one of the following STAR performance labels. If they did not meet grade level, that means that student is unlikely to succeed in the next grade without significant ongoing academic interventions. The satisfactory or passing level and STAR is the approaches grade level. That indicates that students are likely to succeed in the next grade with targeted academic interventions moving forward. Students that score at the meets grade level have a high likelihood of success in the next grade or course, but may still need some short-term targeted academic intervention. Students who score at the master's grade level on the STAR test are expected to succeed in the next grade or course with little or no academic interventions. So how it works for STAR is that we look at these three performance levels. Now in the previous accountability systems, we were only concerned with the passing or satisfactory level on STAR. Our new accountability system as required by Hospital 22 looks at performance at the approaches grade level and the meets grade level. But we're also including the master's grade level because that encourages districts and campuses to push high performing students to further excel. What we're going to do is average these three levels of performance. And that level is comparable to the percentage of students who achieve the meets grade level standard. So let's say you are a elementary or middle or a high school and you want to calculate your student achievement domain result for STAR. So for STAR, this is what we're going to do. Again, we're looking at STAR tests with and without accommodations and we're looking at alternate assessments. So we're going to take all STAR tests by all the subject areas that are applicable for your campus and district. So we're going to add together all of the reading assessments, all of the math assessments, any applicable writing assessment, any applicable science assessment and social studies that was taken at your campus and district. We'll add together all the STAR subject tests to get a denominator of total assessments. In this example, we have 16, 17 total assessments that were taken um, at this particular uh, campus, for example. Of all of those assessments, we then evaluate the number of those assessments in the second column, uh, I'm sorry, this, in the middle area, um, the number of those assessments at the approaches grade level or above. So of all my tests taken at my campus, what are the number of assessments that met the approaches grade level and above? In my example, I have 878, which is divided by 1617, my denominator, to give me 54, 54%. So that's saying 54% of those assessments taken at my campus were at approaches or above. Then we look at the number of assessments at the meets grade level and above. In this example, I have 531 assessments that are at the meets grade level and above. 531 divided by 1617 gets me 33%. So 33% of my assessments at my campus or my district were at the meets grade level and above. And then we look at the number of assessments at the um, master's grade level and above. 337 divided by 1617 gets me 21% at the master's grade level. So I have three percentages for STAR. On the right hand side I have approaches, meets, and masters. Three percentages of performance. I add those percentages together to get a total. In this example I have 108. I then divide that by three and that is the score for the student achievement domain. 
So what does a 36 mean? Is that an A? Is that a D? Is that an F? So when you get your component score or your raw score, for example, we need to align that score to letter grades and scores that are commonly understood or the common conception of what a letter grade is. So we have to scale that result. So we take a raw result or that component score and we scale it to the normal convention of what the public understands to be an A, B, C, D, or F. We have a full explanation of this methodology and formulas uh, in our 2019 accountability manual. And we have a scaling tool as well if you don't wanna hand calculate these uh, scaling results. So let's say that you are an elementary campus. 100% of your domain result comes from STAR. So if you had a 36, like I just said, in my example, that is your component or your raw score. But the public doesn't understand what a 36 is. So we have to scale it to a normal convention of what an A through F would be. So that scales to a 62 for the student achievement domain. Now the public understands that 60 to 69 is a D. So that 62 then gets a D letter grade in the student achievement domain. Because for an elementary, 100% of the student achievement domain comes from STAR tests and nothing else. Now, if you're a high school and you graduate seniors, we also look at the graduation rates and whether or not those graduates are college, career, and military ready. So that 36 scales to a 62 just for the STAR component. But we still have two other components to look at for a high school or K through 12 or a district that graduates seniors. So let's talk about if you are a college, uh, if you are a high school, a K through 12, uh, or the district, let's talk about CCMR, college career and military readiness. What we do for this component is we evaluate your graduates to see if they meet any one of the following criteria. So to be CCMR, college career military ready, a graduate would have to meet one of the following. To be considered college ready, that graduate would have to meet the criteria of a three on the AP or four on the IB exam. And that's in any subject area. If not, then they can be college ready by meeting the Texas Success Initiative criteria on either the SAT, the ACT, the TSI assessment, or by taking and meeting the requirements for a college prep course in reading and in mathematics. So they have to meet the TSI criteria on the SAT, ACT, the TSI assessment, or a college prep course in reading and in mathematics. And I'll talk about that in detail on the next slide. If not, that graduate can complete a course for dual credit to be considered college ready. They would need nine hours or more in any subject area or three hours or more specifically in ELAR or math. If not, the graduate could earn an associate's degree while in high school to be considered college ready. Something new for 2019 ratings that we did not do in 18 was that if the graduate completes an on-ramps course in any subject and earns college credit, they could be considered college ready. And I'll talk about on-ramps uh, in the next few slides. If that graduate doesn't meet the criteria for college ready, they could be considered military ready by enlisting in the US Armed Forces. If the graduate is not college or military ready, they could be career ready by meeting the following. They earn an industry-based certification. And I'll talk about those in detail in a second. Or they take a CTE, coherent sequence course, and they receive credit aligned with industry-based certifications. However, if the graduate does only take the coursework, they only receive half a point of credit. I'll talk about that in detail in a second. To be considered college ready, another uh, item would be that graduate uh, graduates with a completed IEP with a workforce readiness code of 04, 05, 54, 55. What do those codes mean? I'll talk about that in a second. Or that graduate can earn a level one or level two certificate. 
that's something new for 2019, along with that graduate could uh, graduate with an advanced degree plan and be identified, so long as they're identified as a current SPED student. So let me talk about some of these other indicators in detail. Let me first talk about the TSI criteria. So I said that previously a graduate could be considered college ready if they meet the TSI criteria. This is specifically what we're looking at. We're looking at scores on the TSI assessment, the SAT test, the ACT test, or by taking a college prep course. So specifically, we're looking for a criterion score on the TSI assessment at 351 or above on reading and 350 or above on math. Or if that graduate takes the SAT test and scores higher than a 480 on the evidence-based reading and writing portion or higher than a, three, a 530 on math or above, then they can meet the TSI criteria. Or if that graduate takes an ACT test and has a 19 on English and higher than a 23 composite, they could meet it that way, or a 19 on math and higher than 23 composite uh, for that portion. The thing with the TSI criteria is that you can mix and match. So you could meet the criteria for reading using the TSI assessment and meet the criteria for mathematics using the SAT math portion. You have to meet the criteria in both reading and math for the TSI criteria, but you can use it using one assessment and another. Like for example, reading for SAT and math for ACT, so long as they meet the following criteria. Let's talk about CTE and industry-based certifications. So that graduate could be considered career ready if they earn an industry-based certification. Currently we have 73 industry-based certifications that the graduate can earn for 2019. You might have heard that we released an updated list of the industry-based certifications. That's scheduled to go into effect for the 1920 school year, and that will apply for ratings in August of 2021. Sorry, August of 2021. You can view that updated list at the following website. Additionally, the CTE courses that align with the industry-based certifications will include 19 additional courses. You can view those additional CTE courses on the following website. Level one and level two certificates, those are awarded by an institution of higher education, like a two year or four year public or private school, uh, certifying the completion of a higher education program. A level one certificate would be awarded for completing a program consisting of at least 15 hours and no more than 42 semester credit hours. A level two certificate would be awarded for completing a program of at least 30, but no more than 51 credit hours. Now, certificates are different from certifications. Um, they are awarded by institutions of higher education, where a certification is administered by a certification body, like a trade association, for example. These certificates come from higher ed programs um, and do not typically have to be maintained for that particular, uh, like, like they would for a certification. This data comes to us from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Something new for 2019 is that current SPED students could be considered career ready if they graduate with a completed IEP and workforce readiness using these graduation type codes, 04, 05, 54, 55. Those codes come from PEAMS. So for example, if you have a SPED student who graduates under the minimum high school program, you can code them as an 04 if they have full-time employment with sufficient help, self-help skills to maintain employment without public school services, or 05 if they've demonstrated mastery of specific employability and self-help skills that do not require public school services. Or that SPED student could graduate with a 54-55. You would code that student in PEAMS under the Foundation High School program with uh, a 54 if they had self-help skills to maintain employment without public school services, or a 55 if they had developed mastery of specific employability and self-help skills. Current SPED students that have an ad advanced degree plan um, can be considered career ready 
if they are receiving special education services in the current school year of graduation and they graduate with either a recommended, a distinguished, a foundation high school plan with an endorsement or a foundation high school plan with a distinguished level of achievement. They would not get credit if they graduated under the minimum or foundation high school plan, the 22 credit hour plan, for example. The SPED student would have to be uh, graduate and also graduate under recommended distinguished foundation with endorsement or foundation with distinguished level of achievement to be given credit for CCMR. On-ramps. On-ramps is uh, dual enrollment through the University of Texas at Austin. It's part of the university's core curriculum. And when the student gets credit for that, that credit can transfer to other public colleges, universities in Texas. The UT Austin on-ramps program su uh, supplies the agency with CCMR credit. And so that credit is awarded for successful course completion uh, from the student who takes the class, regardless of whether or not the student accepts the credit hours. Okay, I mentioned CTE and half points. So previously we looked at all the different ways a graduate could meet the CCMR indicators. But if all they do is take the coursework for the certification, they don't actually earn the certification, but they take the coherent sequence coursework for that certification. It's like they take the coursework and they're halfway to the certification. If that's the case, they only receive half a point of credit, not the full credit for CCMR. Now we're phasing this out though. So for, 19, for 2019 and 2020, if the graduate only takes the coursework and nothing else for CCMR, then they only get half a point of credit. And that's going to be phased out beginning in 2021, where we hope to see the graduates have an industry-based certification if they want to be considered career ready. How do we calculate CCMR? So for CCMR, we're looking at your annual graduates. So the denominator for this particular component is your number of 2018 annual graduates. The students that graduated um, that summer of 2018. That's your uh, denominator. Your numerator would be those graduates who accomplished any one of the CCMR indicators. So if they meet any one of those, they're given one point of credit. Even if they meet three or four or five of those indicators, they only get one point credit maximum. Now, for those CTE coherent sequence coursework uh, students who just take the coursework and nothing else, they only get half a point of credit. If they take the coursework and, for example, they meet three on the AP or four on the IB, then we'll give them the full point of credit because they met a different criteria. But if they take nothing else but the CTE coherent sequence coursework, they only get half a point of credit. So an example calculation would be our denominator, would be our 2018 annual graduates. Let's say we had 250 annual graduates in 2018. Our numerator would be those graduates who earned uh, CCMR points. One point of credit is given for meeting any of those CCMR indicators that I just mentioned half a point would be just for those graduates that had the coursework without the certification. Numerator, numerator denominator gives me my raw or my CCMR component score. Okay, let's talk about the graduation rate. We talked about STAR, we talked about CCMR, and now if you're the high school, the K through 12 in district that has a graduation rate, we're gonna look at the following. We look at a four year a five-year or a six-year longitudinal graduation rate. This has state exclusions where we would exclude, for example, court order JGA AEP students. So our denominator for this calculation is graduates, continuers, students who have a Texas high school equivalency certificate, like a GED, and then dropouts. Your numerator would be the number of graduates in the class. What we do is we calculate 
a four year, a five year, and a six year. So we have a four year class of 2018 rate. We have a five year class of 2017 rate and a six year class of 2016 rate. Based on those rates, we're going to take the highest rate of the four year, five year, six year. Whatever is higher is what's going to be used for the graduation rate score for the graduation rate component in student achievement. So in this example, 97.5 for my five year class of 17 rate is the highest and that's what's used for accountability. So how do we calculate the student achievement rating? So as I mentioned, we have to scale our results. So for STAR, in my earlier example, I had a 36 component score for STAR, and that was scaled to a 62, the normal convention of what the public understands. We also do the same thing for CCMR and for the graduation rate. Each of those component scores has to be scaled. So using the accountability manual or online scaling tool, you would scale not just STAR, but your CCMR result and your graduation rate result. So for CCMR, in my example earlier, we had a 78 component score. Well, that gets scaled to a 95. For the graduation rate, the 97.5 still has to be scaled and that scales to a 90. So let's say that you are at high school and you have all three components, STAR, CCMR, and the graduation rate. These three components have to be weighted based on the following. 40% for STAR, 40% for CCMR, and 20% for the graduation rate. So we take the scaled score for those components and we weight them. So my scaled score for STAR was a 62, if you remember. That gets multiplied by 40% for total points, 24.8. My CCMR scaled score is weighted by 40% and I get 38 for the total points for that CCMR component. The graduation rate is weighted at 20%, which gives me an 18 total points for the graduation rate. I add together my total points for STAR, CCMR, and the graduation rate. And then I round, which gets me an 81. Now, this is my overall student achievement domain score using my scaled score results. The public understands that anything from 80 to 89 is a B, so we grade this high school for these three components in this example with a student achievement domain rating of a B. So that's what the public will see on the report card and that's what we'll have on our data tables. Student achievement 81 equals a B. Now if you are a elementary or a middle school 100% of your rating in student achievement comes from STAR. So in my earlier example, we had a 62 scaled score. So 100% of the rating would be 62. And that 62, and the public understands, anything from 60 to 69 would be a D. So if you're in elementary or middle school, 62 or a D rating label. But if you have all three components, we would weight them like I just did, add together and round. And in my example, we had an 81 or a B. And that's how you receive a rating in the student achievement domain. So this was just a very high level overview of the student achievement domain in the 2019 accountability system. There are um, some additional components and some caveats to this. For a comprehensive explanation of the student achievement domain, please review the 2019 accountability manual, at the following website. If you're looking for additional training opportunities or a comprehensive review of the student achievement domain, you can contact your local education service center. They are always happy to do, um, do professional development. They always host trainings on accountability, on assessment. Um, so 
contact your local service center if you are interested in additional training opportunities. So ratings are approaching. If you are administrator at a campus on uh, August 7th, we're going to release your preliminary performance domain data tables. This will have uh, your data without rating labels. This will be in Teal Accountability. On August 14th, we'll have released district and, and campus ratings in Teal with rating labels. On August 15th, all accountability ratings for all campuses and districts will be public and posted to the agency website and across newspapers, uh, anywhere else because the ratings will be public. So August 15th, this August, is when ratings are released to the public. We'll have copies of this presentation and other resources posted to the following websites. Every week we send out a weekly bulletin from performance reporting on new updates to the accountability system and what we're working on. You can sign up for that by going to the TEA homepage and you can click on the link at the top where it says sign up for updates, sign up for performance reporting or weekly bulletin. We have links for you um, for resources and contact information. All of this information can be found on the accountability homepage the 2019 Accountability Rating System, also for FAQs for the 2019 Accountability Manual, and eventually data tables for each of the campuses and districts will be at the following link. If you have any questions regarding accountability, please send us an email at performance.reporting at tea.texas.gov. You can also call us at 512-463-9704. Thank you so much for viewing this webinar. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Thank you so much.